Relations Team at Deschutes Public Library. And you are here tonight for a program that is part of our series called No Flight. And uh, we are welcoming Mike Langford tonight to talk about uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Mike Langford is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and has been an editor teacher for 30 years. His previous works include essays, newspaper, opinion columns, short stories, and book reviews. He is the author of Life in Double Time, Confessions of an American Drummer, a top 10 music critics book of the year, and Becoming Leonardo, an exploded view of the life of Leonardo da Vinci, a Wall Street Journal top 10 nonfiction book of the year. He currently teaches at Central Oregon Community College. Welcome, Mike. Looking Thank you. Tonight, tonight's presentation. Thank you. Well, I'd, uh, I'd like to go ahead and start then. Um, thank you everyone for uh, for attending tonight. And I'd especially like to thank the Deschutes Public Library, Liz Goodrich and Paige Farrell for inviting me. Everyone, welcome. <clears throat> My talk tonight is about human flight and the imagination that gave rise to it, but especially the imagination how it is that a clumsy earthbound mammal with no feathers, but a big brain, not only learned to fly in the air above, but into the blackness of space, even beyond that. An astonishing story. How did it happen? Well, the short answer is it was that big brain. Probably the most remarkable ability of humans is that of seeing and interacting with things and beings that are not actually there. We call this ability imagination. And of all the human activities recorded since history began, probably nothing represents this quirky ability more than human flight. And this comes in part from our unique ability to project ourselves into another being. We wonder, what is it like to be a bear? Or what is it like to be a lion or a bird? Imaginative projection is why ancient people wore animal teeth and bones and feathers and still do to acquire the spirit of the beast. The 16 year old male you see in downtown Bend wearing a Terminator t-shirt, that's projection. Sigmund Freud was the first to recognize this and give it a name. It is the basic psychology of all action films and love dramas. You are the hero. So clearly, <clears throat> we've been flying in our heads long, long before we ever managed to actually do it in the air. We know from ancient times that humans have always aspired to flight and have likewise been falling out of the air for about as long. Truly a fascinating history, not of accomplishment, but of unrelenting failure over and over for thousands of years. A quick look back captures some of this amazing human spirit in the clearest of ways. Greek myth preceded it, <clears throat> as in the story of Daedalus and Icarus, as you heard from Kristen Dorsey a couple of weeks ago. But the first actual attempt on record was back in the fourth century BC, when Archytas, a good friend of Plato, built a bird-shaped device that was self-propelled by steam and ran on a wire called the pigeon. It was probably a toy model and was reputed to have flown 200 meters. Toy models, as we shall see, have had a huge effect on the development of aviation. In the first century AD, Japanese emperor Wang Mang recruited a specialist who was wrapped with bird feathers. And it is claimed he glided about 100 meters. This method of flight we now refer to as tower jumping. Shortly after that, 559 AD, the emperor's own son, Yong uh, Hangtao, is said to have landed safely from an enforced tower jump. We're not sure why he was forced to do it, but he landed safely. Even earlier, the Chinese invented kites, and along with them, manned kites, or kites with a rider. A man named Mosey first invented the kite in the 5th century 
BC. Think of that. Socrates is walking the streets of Athens and Buddha is sitting under the shade of the boa tree while in China, this guy Mosey is hard at work making kites, testing to see how big they could be and what they could lift into the air. It's important to note that manned kites in China were used both for military surveillance and as a punishment. Marco Polo at the time wrote that a man tied to a kite was used to divine the right time for sea journeys. And he commented on the hazards and the cruelties involved in such a method. And these are only a few of the stories that have come down to us. Most attempts at flight were never recorded as they failed miserably. And people generally were illiterate and didn't write about it. But the thought was always there. The dream never faded away. Muhammad's own dream in 536 AD of flying in minutes from Medina to Jerusalem and back is indirect evidence of this. He was able to tell the story and be believed because that dream had occurred to others as well. It did not sound crazy to him, to other people. I've had flying dreams for years. It's just built into us. The ninth century scientist Abbas Ibn Furness reportedly make a, made a jump in uh, Cordoba, Spain, covering his body with vulture feathers this time and attaching two wings to his arms. Furness flew some distance, they say, before landing with injuries attributed to his lacking a tail. Writing in the 12th century, William of Malmesbury, a Brit, stated that an 11th century Benedictine monk, Elmer of Malmesbury, attached wings to his feet and hands and flew a short distance but broke both legs while landing, again, having neglected to make himself a tail. By the time we get to the 15th century, attempts to fly had become populated with great myths out of the past, usually illustrating human folly and God's divine plan, i.e., if God meant us to fly, he'd given us wings. Which is a fascinating question. Were we meant to fly? or are we violating the natural order of things? We can take a vote at the end. Hard as it is to believe today, invention itself was considered sinful by the church during medieval times. They called it playing God. The figure of Leonardo comes rising out of the mist about here. He did probably the most meticulous research into flight of anyone up to that time and made major discoveries like the upward and downward pressure of the air on a wing. But like all of Leonardo's discoveries, they were forgotten as his notebooks were pulled apart and disappeared into studios and libraries around Europe or were simply lost as half of them were about 6,000 pages. Only in the late 1700s were Leonardo's studies of flight and water hydrology, and atmosphere, not to mention the science of painting and anatomy, were rediscovered, but much too late to have any influence on others. Clearly, though, he was way ahead of the game in all those fields. So what would his influence have been if he'd gotten off his butt and published his research? Anka would have shown other inventors an early version of the scientific method of trial and error and experimental thinking. But most importantly, his notebooks would have shown the value of the thought experiment, something that Einstein is famous for now. Much of what you see in Leonardo's notebooks are thought experiments. Because he was able to draw so extraordinarily well, his thoughts seemed real and tangible. But in fact, he was frequently visualizing an experiment without having to build a model, working it in his mind. What Leonardo first showed us was a scientific theoretical approach to solving the problems of flight. And had his example been out there for others, no doubt it would have changed everything. 
he made at least two attempts at actual flight, but his experiments mostly included scale models. Toy gliders existed already and had for hundreds of years, as did toy spinners, a propeller on a stick. You know, you've seen those things, which no doubt inspired him. But the problems of scale bedeviled him. Building a large version of a small toy means dealing with weight concerns, changing aerodynamics, and major control issues. Among his various methods, Leonardo's approach to this included studying birds, of course. He was locally famous for buying birds in the market, meant for dinner, and releasing them instead. The assumption being that vegetarian Leonardo was giving them their freedom. But I rather suspect he was watching them closely for another reason. From first flap to that moment, they grabbed the air and began to rise. And it was that moment he tried to understand the most difficult moment of flight, how to take off. If Leonardo had a reputation for releasing birds, it probably had less to do with animal rights and more to do with his projects at the time. His first attempt at flight with a full-scale prototype, we know from an entry in his notebook from about 1500, where he refers to a model glider he pushed off the roof of the Milan Cathedral. No witness accounts survive. <clears throat> then again in 1505, after years of modeling and theorizing, he built a full-scale model which he attempted to fly off a hill outside of Florence. No record of this attempt survives either, but there were no doubt many witnesses as the aircraft had to be assembled in his workshop and transported out of town and up on the hill. He had by this time started a notebook on the flight of birds and had several ideas either for powered flight or later for gliders. At a certain point in his notebook, he announced as if to the world that tomorrow, quote, the great bird will take its first flight from the back of the great swan, filling the universe with amazement and filling all the chronicles with its fame and bring eternal glory to the nest where it was born, close quote. Uh, which, you know, is, is worth quoting, if only to note the difference between Leonardo inventing flight and a modern Boeing engineer proposing a project, project, no metaphor, you know. Um, but he announced the flight, it was to occur on his 53rd birthday, and then drops the subject entirely. So we can assume that if he had flown, he would have written about it, but nothing was said. Again, the attempt to fail. And it should be said that Leonardo himself more than likely was not the one strapped into the craft uh, pushed off the cliff. He was, as I said, 53 at the time, but had an assistant, Zoroaster, a mysterious and shamanistic character who was with Leonardo most all of his life and who was a considerable inventor himself and 20 years younger. So it was likely Zoroaster who actually attempted to pilot the craft. It's interesting to note here that in many early examples of manned flight, so-called, that we hear about, it is the inventors themselves early on who strap on the wings and feathers and make the jump off the tower. But as the risks become apparent over time, it was more often the assistants who took the first leap. Or in ancient China, war captives or slaves tied to kites. It's entirely possible that the very first actual human experience of flying, so to speak, was had by a terrified slave strapped to somebody's experiment 100 feet in the air, which is probably not an exhibit you'll see at the Air and Space Museum, but early flight could be a dirty business at times. Leonardo had multiple problems with his craft but if he learned anything from his glider experiments, it was that he too had a huge problem with the tail. He was aware of how a bird used its tail to land, but how to, and how to change direction using its whole body to torque and turn in the air. Mechanically, 
Leonardo couldn't come up with an equivalent to flared tail feathers. Specifically, what he couldn't figure out was what we call today the vertical stabilizer and left-right rudder control. Had that idea popped into his head in 1505 and he bothered to publish it, we would be living in a different world today. Leonardo moved on to other projects he wanted to understand, water mainly, and stopped writing about flight. He was designing a canal lock system around Milan and was bedeviled by silt building up. His aeronautical experiments fell away and were never seen by other inventors, many of whom, as a consequence, never gave up on the suit of feathers idea, thinking there was some magic in feathers. That's the difference between critical thinking and wishful thinking. Leonardo was largely forgotten after his death in 1519. His notebook scattered and locked away. The same with his few paintings for the next 200 years or more. If he had a reputation at all, it was for the Last Supper on a wall in Milan, which had been flaking and peeling almost since it was finished. Leonardo had experimented with paints there too and not gotten things quite right. But the examples of his thinking on flight, his experiments and theories, his rational approach to problem solving, which means no feathers, all that was hidden away for two centuries. But the effect, but, but the effort carried on without him. Lots of tower and steeple jumping during the 17th and 18th centuries, each broken femur, hopefully teaching a new lesson. It wasn't until 1783, 283 years after, after his death, that the Montgolfier brothers floated the first hot air balloon over Versailles that the public saw sustained flight for the very first time. And once people knew it was possible to hang safely in the air, the rush was on. The public imagination had been lit, and that's the key. In 1790, just seven years later, Brazilian-born Portuguese priest Bartolomeu de Guzmão duplicated the fleet the feat by floating a hot air balloon in Lisbon, setting off another frenzy of imagination, and was followed by countless others experimenting with gliders, dirigibles hydrogen gas, helium, and of course, finally, the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, in 1902, working out of their small bike shop in Dayton, Ohio. But until that last hundred years of strenuous discovery and collective imagination, flight was only in our heads and buried in there deep indeed. Today, Think of Superman's natural ability to leap from a tower and soar away. Superman's powers came from those eternal ancient desires for strength and vulnerability and, of course, flight. We are, as they say, living the dream. On a personal note, my father was a pilot. And the time he spent in the air during World War II was the high point of his life. My father was born in a sod house on the old Comanche Reserve in Southwest Oklahoma and grew up not only in the dirt, but under it, the roof being made of sod. For me, his aspiration to fly was obvious and he had a great role model as a teenager in Wiley Post, an early aviator and world record holder and local Okie having grown up in Maysville nearby. Oklahoma has a huge part in the history of flight in the United States, and I very much grew up with that dream. But that's another subject, I'll let it go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike, that was really beautiful and um, touching. I, I just got a couple of questions. Uh, before, but before I ask mine, I just want to let you know that 
Laura, who's on the call tonight, on the webinar tonight, she says, this is a beautiful lecture. Love the language and thoughtfulness. Thank you. Um, but I, I have a couple of questions. I'm wondering where, where did you go to do your research? Um, this was clearly methodically researched. And I'm, I'm curious as to your, your sources for tonight's presentation. Well, uh, th this, most all this research was done five years ago when I was working on the, on the book. Um, it, it, it comes from, um, um, probably three biographies mostly Charles Nickel uh, was the was the the big one there uh, but um, there have been a lot of uh, focus studies on on uh, Leonardo's um, um, life uh, and not just as a, a, a dyslectic left-handed dyslectic at, during a time of uh, uh, very uh, limited access to scholarly materials and like that. It, it really didn't, my research didn't come from any single place. I wish it had of, but it was comparing book to book. And uh, in, in, the, in the back of uh, Becoming Leonardo, there's, I don't know, probably over 150 books. Um, that were stitched together. It's a slow process. And, and it's interesting uh, that I did it all, and most all of it from books on the page. Uh, doing research online is very different because you don't get to make notes and you don't get to compare this book with that book with the next book. And, and so I, I, I basically bought everything from Amazon and, and, and read it here and uh, um, slowly, uh, sorted it out. The, the, the key thing was an early distinction between following uh, the subjects that Leonardo was famous for in traditional kind of art history ways, or to do the research to answer my own questions, not those asked by others, but my own questions. So my book about Leonardo was very much a personal quest to, to answer for myself how, how different or similar he was to us. And and he's, he, he really is, you know, like a lot of people I've known, uh, both good and bad. I've known people with enormous talents in the right place at the right time, and they, and they succeed wildly. I've known other people as talented in the wrong place at the right time. And, uh, and it, it's a life of, of frustration. And, uh, and I'm, I'm working on my memoir right now, and I'm, I'm writing about people like that. And the whole issue of talent and how it survives in the world is enormously complex, but luck has a lot to do with it. Yeah, it, that, that, that's a beautiful segue into my next question. I was really struck when you said, um, you know, he kind of was forgotten for a couple of, hundred, of hundreds of years. And it's, to me, it's hard to imagine him being forgotten. Um, and I'm wondering why you, why he wasn't more revered during his own lifetime, which may have kept him in the, in the forefront of people's minds. Well, during his lifetime, he, um, he was revered by oh. certain people. Uh, Machiavelli was a good friend of his. <laughs> um, weirdly enough, yeah, I got him a job uh, at one point, which was very traumatic because Leonardo went went to war as a technical advisor. But he, he was, um, I was surprised to find was a much more contentious personality. <clears throat> you either loved Leonardo or you had some grudge against him. And there were a lot of reasons to have a grudge against Leonardo. He was not a dependable employee. He worked for the Duke. The Duke wanted things done on schedule on budget and Leonardo would start on one thing and he'd drift to something else and then he'd find himself on a third subject and he, he required a lot of supervision and he still ran over. I mean, the, the last supper uh, was probably two years over date uh, because he kept distracting himself. So Leonardo um, was, 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 a, was a complicated person and difficult to understand. And my analysis of this, uh, not just in, in historical terms surrounding Leonardo, but 
I've studied biography my entire life. I've, I've read thorough bi. I've read everything Mark Twain ever wrote, Leo Tolstoy ever wrote. There's a short list of people I have studied as much as I've studied Leonardo. And you see these similarities across the, across the board. And one of the things that's, that jumps out at you is that the people who loved Leonardo were the ones intelligent enough to see the potentiality in the man. They, they could understand not just what he said, but what it meant. And when he speculated on something, they could imagine the result. The people who had problems with Leonardo, just like the people that had problems with Mark Twain or uh, other creative types, were literal people with very specific demands and, and an expectation that he behaved like the last person. And these are unique individuals. So Leonardo was, was a, a, a difficult person to know at the time. But then once he died, he, he had you know, like about 15 paintings. So out there, I mean, he, and, and, and they weren't all attributed to him immediately. And, and the, the journals, the, the, the notebooks were not out there. So what carried Leonardo's reputation forward was basically the, the memories of people who had known him. And then 50 years after he died, Vasari comes along and starts writing these biographies of, of the artists. And what he got were the memories of the, the few people still alive. Uh, and, and, and it was Vasari who, who basically made it possible to, to remember Leonardo. But with the paintings all locked away someplace and, and the, the notebooks scattered all over Europe or lost or burned up, um, there just wasn't that much for people to, uh, to appreciate about them. And it really started in the 1800s in Germany. That was where the Renaissance was rediscovered, so to speak. And German academics and then British academics uh, started resurrecting. And, 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 uh, and the big surprise was it was not all about Michelangelo. Michelangelo throws such a huge shadow. Michelangelo is an astonishment. I mean, Leonardo was a, a, a world-class, maybe the greatest ever draftsman world-class painter, um, designer, but he didn't write very well. And, and, and he, of course, wrote backwards and he was dyslectic and, 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 and a lot of problems. His, his prose is stiff and wooden. Michelangelo's prose was poetic. Michelangelo published poetry. He, he produced sculptures. He, he was an architect. He, he uh, you know, he, he was the, the total package. And with someone like Michelangelo on, on, the, on the scene, an, an ephemeral kind of liminal character like Leonardo, where so much of it is clearly in his head, but he, he just won't write it down, uh, is, 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 is an enigma. And how he comes to us from history, uh, it carries that, that, that enigma. And that was a big part of my fascination in trying to figure the guy out. Yeah, I, I, I want this is just something that just popped into my head. You mentioned Kristen Dorsey's uh, presentation about Daedalus and Icarus. And I am wondering if we can tease this one out a little bit in that if you ask any thinking, any person who's gone through public school or, or even listens to music or reads books, we have an understanding of Icarus. We know who Icarus is. Um, the flying too close to the sun, the hubris. Um, very few people I, I would challenge or posit could tell you who Daedalus was, the inventor that invented so many things, yet his son captures more of the imagination because he's the one who put on the wings yeah. and, and crashed. And I'm super curious. I mean, what can, what can we extract from that myth and apply to Leonardo, the inventor who played with flight. Well, the 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 function of, of that myth and other myths were were moral life lessons. Right. So where Daedalus was the practical man of, of the world and 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 the creator, Daedalus, uh, Icarus's son was the passion artist, was the one who with the tools would not only use them but overuse them. 
see how far it, it, it could take them. And it was a cautionary tale, I suppose, for, for, for the cultures uh, hearing it. And, and, and I think that the, the caution was to not overreach, to, to, to not assume godlike potentiality because you will be struck down, you know. And, and like I said, you know, invention and, and, and that sort of aspiration was considered sinful in the middle ages and, and before. So, so the, 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 the consequence was to, to warn people off it. But when you look at a, a, a creative personality like Leonardo, these cautions have a very peculiar effect. Instead of warning him away, they seem to provoke him to look closer at it. Telling Leonardo not to look at something is the wrong strategy, you know? So I, I think throughout history, while you, you generally kind of caution against bad behavior, uh, you're also provoking your creators to look more closely at it. Yeah, super, super interesting. I really have loved this series about, and, and your presentation tonight was really um, spot on about the whole, the whole mystery of flight and humans taking flight um, and, and, Leonardo da Vinci's role in making that happen. So any any last remarks um, before we we say goodnight? Oh, uh, gee, I wish I could see everybody. I, I, oh, I, I, here, I hold on. I have a. There's another question. Okay. Uh, Laura says, "Oh my gosh, this was one of my favorite talks of all time." So, oh, Laura. thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you. I, I enjoyed it too. I, I'm really fascinated by by these thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci and that can be these huge brains that function in both yeah. artistic world and the scientific world, I think. Oh, okay, here's a question. Is there, do you think, I don't know if this is a silly question, but do you feel like there's anybody who embodies the spirit of Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo that those people who can write, create, be scientific, those, those, for sure I, 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 absolutely and and in in, in fact uh it, it they're alive today and um uh the the fellow who just came up with this gia uh theory about the earth as a as a living organism uh he just died here in the last few months he he's a, he was that kind of guy um yeah there are a lot of uh, enormously talented people out there but we look at them differently you know we 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 don't expect that kind of polymathic uh ability these days and where we encounter it it tends to complicate things there there was a guy i met at the uh fermi lab in illinois that's where that big particle accelerator is mm -hmm. and i had published my first book about playing drums in a in a rhythm and blues band and this guy was a musician and i, I got to know him through email he, he had played in blues bands he was a guitar player he he, he wrote lyrics composed tunes he he apparently built uh paper flying uh planes i forget what they call that um a fascinating guy, but he his gig was as a physicist, and I mean, you know, it's just a dazzling kind of human being, especially to imagine him up on stage at some blues club, you know, and 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 he's got a head like that. Yeah, the people are out there today, but um, but we we get channeled early, you know, yeah. we're in, institutionalized first in school and then in, in our careers. And the important thing about Leonardo was that he wasn't uh, meeting the expectations of others largely. What was driving Leonardo was curiosity. And he was famously described uh, as perhaps the most curious human being to have ever lived. And for Leonardo, and, and historically this is true, there was not science and art at that time. It was all natural philosophy. It was the world that you encountered and you could approach it in any number of ways. So when he was doing science, he was always doing art and vice versa. And so the attitude you carry, it's not a question of, or should not be a question of where can I fit into a complicated 21st century society, but rather how can I develop myself as completely as possible and survive 
in a larger world that may expect something else from me. And, and that is a hard, hard task. I, I love that, Mike, that we have become so siloed in these, in, you know, these silos in these areas of thinking that we somehow have become disconnected, but they are all, they are all connected, that art is science and science is art and music and all those things. It makes, it makes our world and are walking through the world more rich when we can keep those things um, together and not separate them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, um, those of you on the call tonight, you're going to get an evaluation sent to you. We would appreciate it if you fill it out. Just let us know how we did tonight and uh, what other kind of programs you'd like to see. Uh, Mike, it's been really great visiting with you tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, I'm taking a plane ride in the next couple of weeks and I will be thinking about <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Yeah. yeah good night. Take care, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you.